My name's Guy Kesteven, and this is the YouTube channel where I use my 27 years plus experience professionally testing bikes and kit to give you the latest views and news on everything in mountain biking and gravel. And today, this is a tech check round on the Pivot Switchblade, a distinctive take on the longer travel all mountain trail enduro category from one of the most iconic brands in US mountain biking. So to start off, what category of bike are we talking about here? That's a 160 mil travel fork on the front, and then typically specific and accurate pivot style, you've got 142 mil of travel on this DW link. So a Dave Weagle uh, collaborated and licensed uh, twin linkage design system. I mean, it's been used on a lot of absolutely outstanding bikes over the years uh, from Iron Horse where it kind of made its name uh, and now Pivot are one of the several manufacturers using this system but they all have slightly different uh, iterations uh, just to tune the exact characteristics that they want for their specific brand and also their specific bikes uh, and this bike uh, so 160 front 142 mil rear and this bike as it stands uh, without pedals and without that little uh, supercharger on there, which we'll talk about in a minute, is 13.9 uh, kilos. So relatively light for that longer travel uh, fork category, and uh, but about right for that 142 mil rear end. And you've got to remember uh, that's with alloy wheels rather than carbon wheels if you're comparing weights with other bikes in this category. Now, one area where Pivot always scores super high is they have an absolutely mid meticulous reputation for quality control. If you ever see like alignment tests and stuff like that on pivot bikes, they're always absolutely outstanding. And here you've got little features like uh, these bolt-in securing sections for the uh, internal cable routine. There's nothing coming through the headset here. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know that it's both wireless and wired compatible and it's DI2 Shimano compatible as well. And you can see you've got the exit port there for the wired for the uh, cable to the rear end and again one here because this bike is running wireless but it's fully cable ready you've got really nice raised chainstay protector here and you've got these alloy links have the bearings uh, pressed into them so it's much easier to uh, replace those bearings when the time comes uh, to uh, get some fresh pivots in there uh, rather than uh, risk rounding out the frame as it gets older You've also got a high-low chip here on this single piece. I mean, it's beautifully machined. If you can see, really, on the GoPro down there, but you can see the machining lines in there. It's cold forged and then machined, and it really is a lovely little linkage there. Again, it's keeping them short means they're super stiff. And again, super stiff link H linkage down the bottom here with this little rubber guard there. So any roost coming off the back tyre doesn't drop into those pivots. And then looking under the belly, you've got armor here all the way around. And you've also got, as well as that bottle cage mount there, you've also got an accessory mount under the belly there. Now, if you're riding in England, that isn't a whole heap of use because uh, it's just going to get absolutely covered. And to be fair, you also risk anything that's attached under there from the bike. Uh, I mean, maybe not so much in the XC field, you know, I'm less worried about using them there because you're not going to be hogging out over rocks or logs, but on a bike that's designed to tackle some seriously technical terrain, I'd be a little worried about sticking anything down there because it is likely to get wiped out. Uh, but you do get a conventional bottle mount there and you get a uh, little accessory mount, which I've actually managed, I've had these for ages, but finally got to use them. It's a little uh, to peak pivot collaboration, get all sorts of little uh, different modules, whether it's a tool module or this CO2 uh, setup here. And I particularly like this one because it looks like I'm running a, a little Hot Wheels supercharger on the bike, but it's just the CO2 cartridge there. So you have got that storage there, but you've got no internal storage because as you'll see, these compared to like the bikes I've done recently, like the Santa Cruz Bronson and others, these are relatively slim tubes on here. And Pivot use a different layup, uh, what they call their hollow car carbon on every size bike. And talking about other features, it's a trunnion shock mount here. 
So you've got bearings again on the top for a really, really sensitive uh, shock stroke. And that's very, very obvious when you ride the bike. You've got another little bit more uh, chain protection here. I mean, your train's going to have to get really, really wild to get up there, but nice to have it anyway. Uh, you've got a conventional external bolted collar there with the slot at the front. So that's not getting mud sprayed into the back of it. So, you know, they have thought of some mud friendly features, even though the brand, uh, the brand is based in Arizona. But you can see this back end really quite stout compared to uh, the slimness of that super low top tube. That whole section here on this one piece uh, swing arm is really, really quite sturdy. Plus, if you can't really see it here. I oh, know, no, I reckon you can. That If you're thinking that looks wider than a conventional rear axle, you're right. That's what they call super boost, 157 mil rather than 148 mil. And it was kind of going to be the future. Uh, a lot of downhill bikes use a similar dimension. Uh, it's named differently, but the actual uh, dimension is pretty much the same. And it means because you've got a wider rear end, it means you can run it wider to there. And so there's more tire space. And also it was designed to make the rear end stiffer. And Pivot used it, Saracen used it, Evil used it. But unfortunately, it never really caught on wholesale. And I'd, I'd be very surprised if you see any brands uh, bringing, bringing bikes in going forward with a super boost back end on it which obviously has implications for being able to get spare wheels or if you want to go mullet on this bike which is you know one of the reasons why it has a flip chip if you want to put a small rear wheel in there you're going to have more difficulty sourcing a super boost back wheel than you are a conventional boost back wheel and also that you know going forward that has an implication on spares as well uh, you can see just there DW link painted to worldwide. And then I've just come around to the far side to show another potential issue long term with this bike is that it uses a uh, press fit bottom bracket. So those bearings are actually just pressed into the frame rather than threaded in in a separate cup, which means, you know, you can create this short, very broad, very stiff rear end and you've got maximum support in terms of width on the bottom bracket axle. However, if those bearings wear or if there's any movement comes into that system for any reason, you risk that movement completely writing off your frame if you don't see to it straight away. Whereas if you've got a threaded cup and that goes south, then you just damage the threaded cup and then replace that with a fresh one and there's no issues with it. And it just seems a bit of an odd choice. I mean, yeah, I get the advantages. You can feel them in the ride that you've got this super short, super stiff rear end and still have decent tire clearance in there. I mean, it'll take a 27.5, uh, 2.8 tire or a uh, 29 by 2.5. However, when they've gone to the trouble of... Uh, you know, creating these sh little linkages with the piv with the pivot bearings pressed into them it seems weird that they've stuck with a press fit bottom bracket. And on the bright side, you know, you can at least get really good high quality bottom brackets in a press fit standard now that are going to last a reasonable amount of time. But it's certainly something worth considering uh, when you're looking at a long term ownership of a pivot. And you know, at the price of this bike, you're going to want to get some good mileage out of it. And then moving up here. We've got those uh, extra little cheek plates there for the rear mech. And uh, also you've got spare one there in case you wanted to run the brakes the other way around. So this is set up UK style. So the rear brake is routed through to the left hand lever, but obviously you can flip it around and you're still getting this clamped enclosed cable outlet. Plus if you're ever playing your guitar on the trail and you suddenly need a plectrum, uh, you've got a couple of spares right here on the frame. And I've already said that it's a relatively light bike for a 160mm fork, but it's also uh, not as kind of gravity orientated in the geometry either. So you're looking at a 65.2 or 65.7 head tube, depending on where you have that flip chip, with 465mm reach on this medium. That goes up to 480mm on the large, so that's pretty generous, especially as this seat tube is super short, so only 390mm seat tube there which means that obviously if you want you can go for a longer reach uh, and still get plenty of uh, seat post room uh, if, you know, if you've got relatively short legs for the amount of reach you want and then chainstay length is 429 on the extra small small and medium 431 mil on the large and then it's 435 on the xl so there is a uh, an attempt at some kind of uh, proportional representation in the geometry of the bike. And I have to say, the geometry does work really, really well 
with the vibe of the bike. Uh, I mean, if you've not watched the live ride review there, I haven't, you know, that's just a static because uh, I found that if I have it playing in the background, it really puts people off apparently. So go and click on that and watch the bike being ridden. And you'll see this is, considering it's got a 160mm fork up front, it's much more of a uh, lively trail, agile feel, almost down country feel in some ways because you've got this super sensitive plush, very active uh, shock set up. You've got a very short, snappy, reactive rear end and relatively, you know, fast turning uh, front end as well. So the bike feels really, really lively, engaging and poppy. And you'll see I'm riding with Ryan on a Canyon Spectral, which even though it has relatively similar angles because you've got things like a steering damper on that bike and it's generally, it's generally a bit more gravity focused. This is consistently turning inside Ryan. It's just giving, you know, on tight and more technical stuff, it's giving him a really hard time. So I think, into, you know, although the people have their own theories about numbers and you might have your own preferences, that I think this the numbers of this bike in terms of geometry really, really suit the way it rides. And in fact, the whole the whole bike quality on the trail is absolutely outstanding. This is a lovely, lovely bike to ride, especially if you know you have days where you're riding the super steep stuff, or you're having days where you go out for a big long pedal, or you have combine both of those in the same day. It really is an absolutely outstanding all rounder which is a big help because not only have you got potential issues with super boost and press fit, but also in terms of uh, spec, you're looking at a big spend for, I mean, it's, it's an okay spec, but it's certainly not outstanding. Actually, I should probably rephrase that slightly. I mean, this Fox 36 factory fork is one of the best, if not the best forks in its category in terms of control. And I actually like the fact that uh, this is the slightly older version. It's not in the new Grip X2, because uh, riding it on the Bronson, that was, it's a really, really firm, they've gone back to a really firm, really heavily damped feel, whereas this is a much more fluid and flowing fork, which suits that uh, Fox Factory uh, Flow X shock on the back really well. And you've got a float uh, factory transfer post so again it doesn't make a huge amount of difference uh, I don't think anyone's ever proved one way or the other whether Kashima makes a massive difference but it's just nice to have it all tying up aesthetically and this is a bit of an oddity and um, I mean this probably cost Pivot quite a lot of money to uh, spec a carbon railed saddle and I'm not really sure I mean yeah it helps tip the weight under that 14 kilo mark but People really want a carbon rail saddle on a bike that can send pretty damn hard. Because uh, obviously that cuts into uh, budget elsewhere. Oh, and you do get uh, Pivot's handlebar as well, which is a very nice handlebar. And you get their own stem and you get their own marked up uh, headset. So like I say, I mean, functionally, it's a great spec. You know, you've got uh, SRAM XO, so you're not worrying about I mean, the bottom bracket is relatively high. I'll put the numbers, I've forgotten them, not in notes, so I'll dig them out. But I didn't tap the cranks too much, a little bit at stain burn. So, but I'd say again, bottom bracket how is, chimes really, really well with the bike, how the bike rides overall. And XO rear mech, again, you've got the alloy base and you can see that has taking a bit of a scuffing there, but I'd much rather scuff an alloy mech than crack a carbon fiber wreck. And even, even the brakes, I mean, they're code brakes, so they're not the latest super powerful Mavens. But to be honest, again, I think there's a subtlety and delicacy, and they're not the latest stealth code either. They don't, you know, the lever still uh, points out from the bar there rather than coming in alongside the, uh, the bar on the stealth mounts. But then it doesn't need to feed through uh, a internal headset system and so again i mean they again in terms of how they function i think they work really really well on the bike but obviously if comparing them to the latest bikes these are slightly older generation components and you are still paying bang up to date pricing on this is nine thousand pounds in the uk this bike at the moment and uh you know again Sorry, I just keep going back to different bits. Uh, you know, XM1700 wheels, absolutely great wheels from DT Swear, super durable. You've got triple compound uh, 3C um, DHR2 on the back in an XO Plus, which I'd say was the right kind of carcass weight. And then you've got 
XO Plus on the front as well. Which, to be fair, you know, it's a two, it's a one sixty mil fork. You might be putting that into stuff pretty hard. Uh, although, I mean, the frame's not super rigid. Again, it's got this really nice, nuanced, smooth riding style. But I guess you know, better to have a slightly tougher tire that's not going to explode on you than uh, under under punch on uh, the carcass at the front. So yeah, I mean, again, from practical performance terms, no complaints whatsoever about this overall build, but uh, just a bit of a tooth sucker when you compare it on price to pretty much everything else apart from a Yeti. But then at least with a Yeti, you've got a lifetime warranty on the frame, but whereas this pivot is a 10 year warranty, you know, which is, which is a sizable warranty, but it'd be nice if they just bump that all the way up to a lifetime for complete peace of mind. And the other thing you have to factor in is that while I think this bike still rides brilliantly and very much holds its own on the trail in terms of the latest bikes from other brands, it hasn't really changed since it was introduced in 2022. But otherwise, you know, this is this is a quite an old bike, apart from the fact uh, you've got that new wireless uh, GX axis T-type transmission on there uh, with the UDH hanger. So, although it doesn't matter on the trail, if you look in the marketplace, bikes like that from other brands are being sold off for up to half price at the moment to make way for new stock coming through, which comparatively makes this even more expensive. So together with those uh, bottom bracket and rear axle considerations, there's a lot to unpack if you're thinking about buying this pivot switchblade. But before you make up your mind on that, do make sure you watch my live ride review on this bike, because I think my enthusiasm for it on the kind of dynamic kind of technical trail riding I really like doing might well convince you that while on paper, it might be a bit of an odd decision on the trail, this is still an absolutely outstanding bike that's well worth looking into buying, especially if you can get some leverage in terms of price. But for now, massive thanks to uh, Pivot for letting me have the bike for test. Huge thanks to my industry supporters, uh, some of whom are listed on the back wall there, and I'll put a full list of them at the end of the video. If you could think of supporting them when you're shopping for bike kit, obviously that would uh, encourage them to support me are here on the channel as well. Massive thanks to uh, my Patreon subscribers who pledge on a monthly basis and they really, really are vital uh, to keep the channel growing and to let me spend time talking to you on camera as well as doing the other work I do for websites like Bike Perfect and MBR. So if you really like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider sponsoring me on Patreon and you'll get early exclusive and add free edits of uh, the standard YouTube content as a thank you. But thanks for watching anyway. If you've not subscribed, please subscribe, uh, click for notifications so you know when the next video comes up and tell your mates about the channel because that is the best way for the channel to grow is by more people coming and finding it, watching it, enjoying it and joining part of the Guy Kez TV audience. But for now, I've been Guy Kez TV on Guy Kez TV talking about the Pivot Switchblade. Very distinctive probably in need of a discount, but still an absolutely fantastic aggro all-rounder on the trails.